In this episode, I launch a mission to make a game prototype without an engine. Without the proper knowledge, I could get lost in space, but there's a small chance I find something magical out there in the void. 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 In the last episode, I worked on a space game prototype. The project was attempted six times in three different game engines over the course of a year. But something wasn't quite right. Was my game design bad? No, it was the engines that were wrong. The only thing left to do was to make this prototype without an engine. But what do we need to make a game without an engine? First of all, we'll need familiarity of a fast programming language, maybe a good understanding of fundamental programming techniques, a fair knowledge about the architecture of custom games, and a firm grasp on the tool chain needed to write, build, and debug games. A quick look revealed I didn't have any of those things, but let's not start making excuses now. To help with the journey, I decided to use Raylib, a simple and easy to use library to enjoy video games programming. Raylib is a thin layer of abstraction that helps the programmer open a window, draw graphics, get input from the player, and a bunch of other handy, basic functionality. One might argue that a true custom game should involve building everything from scratch, but as we'll see in a moment, I wasn't quite at that level yet. So step one was to get a project going and include Raylib. I had no experience with command line workflows, so I opted to use good old Visual Studio. And to begin with, I thought I'd see how far I could get with plain C. So I'm already kind of confused. I'm very confused. But before you can begin programming, you must solve the riddle of how to create a project, include your dependencies, and compile your code. Or just watch a YouTube short on it. Oh, right, that, seems, that seems pretty fair. Don't listen to the guy who made it. So this is just the includes in the lib. Okay, I can understand this. Uh, let's just see if we can include raylib.h. <laughs> yes. That's the hardest part of programming. Building. Close window already defined and use the lib. Default. We're in trouble. Things were already off to a bit of a shaky start. He did put them before. What if I did that? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> run it, run it, run it, run it, run it, run it. Sometimes the only thing missing is a pair of brackets. <laughs> Congratulations. We don't need an engine. <laughs> This is going to go so smoothly. With Raylib set up and the project compiling, I started to get to know the library and how to write basic C code. Luckily, Raylib has a collection of examples written in C on the website that show you how you might go about doing different things. And the first thing for me was to draw a triangle in the middle of the screen. Holy sh oh. Oh. To be honest, I was struggling with the most basic facets of C programming. Syntax includes data structures, pretty much everything. But my approach at this point was just try to work on each task one at a time and celebrate when things work and try to learn as much as possible. Using the basic Raylib shape drawing functions, I was able to get some things up on the screen, a player ship flying around with some trails and some stars in the background. My first attempt at asteroids was to use lines and create some kind of randomness, but that didn't work very well. So I just opted for a basic polygon shape and scattered them all around the player. And for something a bit more tricky, I wanted to see if I could get them to collide. Raylib has functions to see if two basic shapes are overlapping, but not apply the physical forces in the collision. So after doing a bit of reading and consulting with my good friend Copilot, I was able to slap together an algorithm that would basically push entities apart when they collided based on their velocity and their size. While progress was being made in C, to be honest, I was feeling a little overwhelmed by the amount of stuff I didn't know. I felt like this lonely spaceship being bounced around in space where the laws of physics had been calculated poorly by a beginner programmer. 
I'd stumbled upon a couple of YouTubers using Odin and Raylib to make games and advocating for this combo for people interested in getting started in lower level game programming. Odin is a systems language built as an alternative to C but with a lot of modern quality of life features. Things like array programming, simplified build systems and project structuring and it comes bundled with Raylib so you just import the package and you're ready to go. So using my C project as a reference and referring to the Odin docs a lot, I started rewriting the project in Odin. I was able to get the basic stuff back pretty quickly. The collisions didn't work straight away, but with some debug drawing and code adjustments, they were squarely back in the good enough zone. Working in Odin felt refreshing at this point. The language seemed intuitive to work with for the most part. So with confidence building, my next goal was to work on some enemy ships. My idea for enemy steering and navigation was to adapt the Boyd's algorithm. This system is a flocking model, which basically gives each Boyd or enemy ship in this case, three forces, separation, alignment, and cohesion. My idea was to adapt this so that the ships would follow the player, but avoid each other and be able to avoid obstacles. A great resource for all kinds of programming challenges is the coding train. This guy does fantastic overviews and implementations of lots of different programming algorithms and whatnots. And of course, he had a flocking sim video. Overall, super helpful. I'm really glad I recorded the process of trying to make these boys work, as it shows just how many ways you can fail to make something. The results were bizarre and sometimes beautiful. And while it may seem like things were broken beyond repair, each bug was just leading me closer to my goal. I hoped. hoped, hoped, hoped. The general Boyd's algorithm was definitely very janky in my implementation, but it was starting to emerge with some interesting behavior as I gave them a force to chase the player. I tried adding their trails back in with a lot of failed results. I tried getting them to avoid obstacles by factoring in asteroids to their avoidance calculations. The results certainly weren't perfect, and there was a lot of tweaking involved, but it looked pretty cool to me. My vision for the game always involved having tons of enemies on screen at once. Even with this basic setup, I was still getting less than 60 frames a second, which highlighted the problem with this type of steering. In order to avoid its neighbors and obstacles, each ship had to check every other ship and asteroid in the whole world, which you can imagine becomes a huge number of calculations each frame. Enter the quad tree. The quad tree is a 2D space partitioning structure where you insert elements into the first quad and then once it's full, it divides itself into four subcells and attempts to insert the elements into those cells. This recursively creates a tree of data and when you want to find out what elements are in a given space, you can query cells in a certain range rather than looking at the entire world. So after a bit of online research and studying another coding train video, I was able to build a basic quad tree that I could test by adding elements with the left mouse button and then querying and arrange with the right mouse button, all visualized with Raylib's draw shape functions. The idea was that every frame, all the ships and asteroids would be inserted into the quad tree and then the enemies would query the tree and arrange to find their neighbors which would be faster than every ship testing every other ship and asteroid in the world. Or so I thought. Here's where my lack of programming experience started to show. Every time I'd run the game, the memory use would grow and grow into the gigabytes, and it should have been less than 100 megabytes at the max. Luckily, Carl Zielinski had a video showing how to set up a memory tracking system in Odin that will log any memory leaked. And yep, we were definitely leaking. One of the naive reasons I jumped from C to Odin in the first place is that Odin had dynamic arrays built in. Dynamic arrays are just normal arrays, but there's some functionality for them to grow in size when they need more capacity. 
Coming from higher level languages, I didn't realize that this memory was allocated and needed to be freed manually. So every frame the quad tree was making tons and tons of dynamic arrays that were just sitting in memory and weren't ever being freed. I didn't exactly know what was going on at the time, but I did know it was something to do with the dynamic arrays. So I just opted to make them all static and give them set limits, which ironically was what I was doing in C in the first place. Later I did discover the way to manually free dynamic arrays using the defer keyword and was able to use them again but a bit more judiciously. But using static arrays helped me plug the leak for the time being. But enough about boring memory management, let's fire some bullets. I was delighted to see that being in the same entity physics simulation the bullets just automatically collided with things in the world. This was my first real eye-opener to how creating a smaller custom system tailored to your game design could be massively helpful. Of course there's a million things missing and so many challenges ahead that I couldn't even conceive, but this process of creating things bespoke just for the game idea that you had was really interesting. And so I just kept experimenting with things. I added an alternative partitioning system where entities were inserted into a grid structure instead of a quad tree and for example a ship could find its neighbours by querying the surrounding cells. I built a little debug system that would draw all kinds of neat stuff to help visualise how things were working or not in most cases. Turns out you can have a lot of fun with just the basics. So far everything was drawn using Raylib's draw functions, draw line, draw rectangle, draw circle. Person, woman, man, camera, TV. So now that the simulation was basically working for enemy steering and collisions, the next thing was to experiment with some basic procedural generation. And having the spatial grid system working, I figured I could just make a much bigger grid and use it to cut the world up into chunks. As the player moved through the world, the system would check the nine cells around the player, and if there wasn't one, create a new cell and scatter some number of asteroids there based on an overall asteroid density value. Maybe that's a little too dense. Enemies were then added based on an enemy density and boom, we had endless generation. Here you can see the enemies still being simulated in the nine cells around the player without being rendered, but I'm drawing the relationship lines between the ships to show they are still moving around. Interested to see what would happen, I turned off collisions for the player and just went full speed in one direction. And to begin with the frame rates were high and the game would just spawn more and more asteroids and enemies as the player moved. Things were pretty stable for a long time, and to be fair this is not a likely scenario for the actual game state, but it was interesting to see what the limitations might be. The main issue showed itself when we got into the tens of thousands of entities created. While they were not simulated or rendered, the main entity loop would have to iterate over all of them and check what cell they should be in. The good news was that with 90,000 entities created we were still only using around 275 megs of RAM, so no leaks at this time. To experiment, I tried removing entities if they were more than three world cells away from the player, which kept the total number stable. You could then go on endlessly, but you would lose the state of distant cells. So the process of working at this lower level had started out intimidating, but as things progressed I couldn't help but fall in love with this manual process of making games. Unity, Unreal and Godot are incredible tools, but being general purpose engines they are designed to cover a wide range of scenarios. But with this process I was able to be very particular about what it is I wanted. Progress was definitely slower than working in an engine, but it had only been about two weeks since I would started, so not bad going. But there was trouble in paradise. As I looked at the state of the code, I was becoming concerned that there was a lot I didn't understand about Odin and programming in general. It seemed like Odin was a great language for those who had a lot of experience in C or C++ and wanted something to deal with some of the pain points of working with those languages. I was loving this prototype and this project in general and I wanted to keep going, but at this point I made a decision to port the current work into C++ for a few reasons. One, I wanted a language that was widely documented with a lot more resources for beginners. And the second one was I needed a proper debugger. 
I was using the VS Code debugger which was a bit basic and I couldn't figure out how to use a third party one with Odin. I know some people can work without a debugger but I had always used one with Rider and Unity and I had found it very helpful. In saying this, I was really enjoying the data oriented approach that Odin uses. So I would attempt to use C++ in a more C-like way. A good way to do this is whenever you use the standard template library, just imagine Mike Acton is looking over your shoulder in disgust. Everyone watching this is fired. In the next episode of DevQuest, I port my custom game prototype to C++ and begin adding sprites, artwork, and a whole lot more. This unlikely attempt to work without an engine becomes an obsession. Congratulations, we don't need an engine. engine, engine, engine.